and welcome to another news roundup with Somerville Media Center and the Somerville Journal. I am pleased to be joined once again with Julia Tallison from the Somerville Journal. Hello, Julia. Hi, Dave. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me once again. Um, so we'll, we'll hit some of the, the hot topics that are going around the city. There, there are a lot. Um, and, you know, most of them have to do with uh, school reopenings, as we'll, as we'll talk about. But as usual, we do want to start off with uh, some some things in and around the coronavirus. Um, so why don't you uh, kick us off with uh, with some COVID updates? Totally. Um, yep. So pandemic is still going on. Um, I just want to kind of check in. So as of uh, Tuesday, August 4th, um, we've surpassed 1,000 cases. So we had um, 1,031 confirmed positive cases, um, 84 total probable positive cases, I think, at the moment. Um, over a 1,000 have recovered, and so far we have sadly had 37 confirmed fatalities. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, the data um, is remaining pretty steady, um, unlike you know a lot of the country with cases kind of just rising, rising a lot, and that's not happening. There, is, there has been an increase um, in the number of new cases per day, but it, it has not been nearly as exponential as in other parts of the world or even in the state. Um, and kind of other things that's going on. So, um, you know, people who've been paying attention to kind of like the phases and right, the business reopenings. Somerville has been pretty cautious and is still in phase two for most of our um, kind of economy. Certain things have progressed to phase three, um, like uh, health visits um, have progressed, but most kind of business phase three openings have been put on hold. Um, the latest I think was released on July 31st, um, which pus pushed it to at least August 17th, um, which is when they said they were gonna be coming out with another update. Um, but this is all, um, it's kind of, you know, it's related to the conversation on schools, it's related to the number of new cases happening around the state and around the country, um, the travel restrictions that are happening in the state and around the country. Um, and that Somerville, I mean, if you kind of look back at how we've been dealing with this, Somerville has been taking a pretty cautious approach, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of, it's persisting essentially. Um, but you know, this is, this is a tough issue. Um, businesses who are in the phase three and phase four um, kind of reopening are definitely having a hard time. Um, you know, I, I definitely, as a journalist, I would love to be hearing from more of these. Um, I think, I think it's just such, such a struggle for many of these businesses that you know, have time to talk to someone like me. Um, but this is um, tough. I know of, you know, at least one business in Davis Square who's lost their space, um, a fitness studio. Um, and it's, it's definitely, it's definitely been tough uh, for some of these businesses. Yeah, yeah, especially as as uh, at the end of July, the the extra six hundred dollars uh, per week uh, that that um, people were getting from unemployment benefits uh, expired. Uh, exactly. And and Congress is still hashing it out, uh, but in the meantime, uh, that safety net is gone for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, that does put businesses. Uh, in a bind, um, and on on the other side of that is the the cautiousness that the mayor is exercising. Um, yep. He's had, you know, if if you follow him on Facebook, you can see uh, kind of the 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 thread of of the thinking there, which you know it has to be tough for any elected official um, right mm -hmm. now, just to you know you're you're kind of um, not in a good place uh, yeah. because you have to mitigate public health with um, your local economy. Um, mm -hmm. And that is exactly where we are right now, Exactly, exactly, yeah. So it's a, it's a tough spot. Um, but you know, just as a general reminder, the city and Cambridge Health Alliance um, is still recommending that everyone is tested. Um, there's still free testing available. Um, it used to be at Somerville Hospital. It has now moved to a site um, on Middlesex of an assembly row um, or assembly square. Um, but the phone number is the same. We have multiple articles up online. The city has all the information on their website about how to get tested. You just got a call to make an appointment, um, but it, you can do it without insurance. You, they don't check immigration status. You don't have to be showing symptoms. Um, in fact, if you've been exposed and you aren't showing symptoms, they recommend getting tested um, because you may be an asymptomatic carrier. Um, so just a reminder that you know, all of this is still very much happening um, and still in place. Um, so just to kind of, you know, get tested if you need to reach out, if you need support. There, there's a lot of stuff in place right now at the city level. 
Yeah, I'll add that um, uh, me and my partner, we got tested last week and it was relatively quick. Yeah, we, we called ahead, which you have to do to make an appointment, um, bike down to the, to the site, which is the old Kmart at Assembly Row. Um, and they have kind of the loading dock section uh, cordon, cordoned off. Um, you know, there's a string of cars for the drive-through testing. We parked our bikes um, and then we, we got tested. It was, it was very quick. Um, I'll add that it was not, uh, it was not painful. It was uncomfortable for a few, <laughs> for 10 seconds, for all yeah. of 10 seconds. Um, and then, and then that was it. And then we got our results uh, two days later. And the fact that it is free um, and, you know, I, I speak to relatives that are in other parts of the country and it's like $50 for a test or, you know, you read news items and, and people are getting billed outrageous amounts for these COVID tests. And the fact that it is free in Somerville uh, is, is a resource that uh, people really should be taking advantage of. Absolutely. I also, I also got tested and I concur. Not painful, not comfortable, but totally worth it to preserve public yes. health. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that, Julia. And then uh, you mentioned that um, school reopenings uh, have been uh, a big part of this conversation uh, nationally and certainly uh, locally as well. Um, the city made an announcement this week. Uh, so what did, what, did the city, uh, what did the city say? Yes. So on Tuesday, August 4th, uh, the city made an announcement that the return to school in September will be remote. Um, this has come after a lot of discussion. I'm sure there is much more discussion to come um, because there are a lot of opinions on this, as there should be. This is a really tough issue um, for parents and teachers and community members and staff and, you know, everyone. Um, so this, um, this is, I'm trying to like kind of put into words. So basically the announcement was made on Tuesday morning, um, but there was a school committee meeting on the, Prior that Monday night, a uh, school committee meeting last Monday night, there was a town hall last week. There's another town hall um, as uh, tonight on the day we're recording this on August 5th um, on education. And, you know, there have been columns, we've received columns from the Summer Teachers Association, columns from concerned parents, um, just, you know, from concerned residents, you know, just all over, right? This, this issue yeah. is, um, it's, it's agonizing. It is, you know, teachers desperately want to be back with their students, but they also don't want to die for this job. Parents don't want their children to die, but they know that their children are losing progress. Um, and this is, it's just, ugh, like covering it has, you know, I just, you know, see it kind of from a distance, but it's still, it's so, it's so hard. Um, so I will say that at this time, um, though the district has announced that return will be remote. Um, there is no kind of there are no specific plans, and part of the reason um, I think they've made this announcement early is has to do with Somerville Teachers Union, uh, who said we want a remote return to school because, and we need you to make this decision now because we want to prepare because right. what happened in the spring was not remote learning; it was crisis learning, and what we need is a robust remote learning plan. So we need time to like find the outlets that we're going to use district wide. We need time to ensure that all families have access to them with Wi-Fi and Chromebooks and all the things they need. Um, we need time to make sure that we can do this well. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's why the district was kind of moved to make this decision early. Um, so I think that's what we're going to see. So at this time, you know, I don't have much to report in terms of a specific plan. Um, just that, you know, the decision has been made that they're going to begin fully remote. Um, but I think a lot of the conversations have focused on um, a phased in approach. That's what the teachers union was advocating for. That's what a lot um, of the school committee members and others seem to support, especially for vulnerable students, students in special education, students of higher need, or just younger students um, who are kind of more high touch mm -hmm. um, or need more supervision to try to prioritize getting them back into classrooms as soon as possible. Um, so I think, um, I know that parents are really advocating for that. So I think over the next couple of weeks, hopefully we're going to see the district come out with some kind of benchmarks and data in terms of like, how are we going to measure when it's time to bring even not just our young students or our high need students back into classrooms. Um, and there are other kind of, the other side of that is the district is also assessing the building ventilation, developing a surveillance testing plan to ensure that when it's time, when the data says, okay, it's safe to bring the students back, 
that they have everything set up, that the buildings are safe to be in, that there's surveillance testing to ensure continued safety of students and staff. Um, so this is, it's definitely still being developed. It's ongoing. Um, but it's, it's been a tough issue and it's not over. <laughs> yeah, I, you yeah. know, the announcement was made on the 4th, but we're, we're in early days of this. I think uh, I think the, the the language that the uh, that the city used was uh, very smart uh, in its announcement, saying that it will start the school year with fully remote learning, seeking mm-hmm. to move toward a hybrid model with an eventual yes. return to full time in person education. And that sounds exactly like what what everybody's what everybody wants. Um, and it sounds like uh, very very re- reasonable, especially compared to. Um, like what we're hearing at the federal level uh, mm-hmm. with with uh, a call for uh, in-person uh, teaching uh, to start in the fall right away. Um, so this is a very measured, very considered approach. And it's mm-hmm. it's and like you said, it's the approach that the teachers unions uh, and that parents were, were looking for. Um, and all that's left at this point is, is the planning, which is no small thing, um, yeah. as, as, as you mentioned. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot to look for in this yeah. helping story. Yes, no, I think there are still, um, I certainly have my work cut out for me in terms of kind of making sure that all of these perspectives are heard um, mm-hmm. in the kind of public discourse, because, you know, some parents want to keep their kids home, some parents want to send their kids back. Most parents just want it to be safe as soon as possible, which is what everyone wants. You know what I mean? <laughs> the teachers want to be back with their students. Um, yeah. But it's, it's all just, it's everyone, I mean, you know, all of the, um, there's been a lot of public comment at school committee meetings, a lot of questions being sent in. And, you know, most of the people who commented, regardless of what opinion they shared, they were just saying like, you know, thank you for the work you've done. And I wouldn't want to be in your position having to make these decisions. Yeah. Um, Cause it's just, it's impossible to please everyone. And it's just, it's so hard to consider, truly consider the needs of every student in developing these kind of like broad general plans. Um, it's just, it's just so tough. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, we're, we'll see. Um, I'll definitely continue covering moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And then the conversations that, um, such as like the digital divide, uh, between mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. um, you know, students that do have access to, uh, fast Wi-Fi and laptops, and then how do you yeah. reach out to the students in the city that don't? Um, and then also like, uh, the, the, the parents that, you know, might be called back to work. Um, they're, they're, they're going to need to figure out a schedule. Um, if, the, the parents of the, of the, ch- of the children, um, you know, are required to be there. Um, it's, it's a tough situation. It's a, it's a lot of tough stuff to figure out. Yes, exactly. That. Actually, asynchronous learning was another thing that's, that was brought up in public comment um, uh, because exa- exactly for that reason. So for the parents who have to go back to work or the parents who work different hours, you know, but who have children who need supervision, um, when when they do work whether because they need support or they just are young and like need someone to kind of help keep them on track um developing learning plans that are flexible and available to those parents that work can be done at night not necessarily just from like 7 a.m to to 2 p.m or 1 p.m or whatever you know what i mean um so i i but again like how do you do it is it for a whole grades is it for classrooms will student will teachers be split up? Like, how is this going to happen? There's so many questions. Um, so many questions. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we'll see. Um, and part of that is, uh, part of the school reopening conversation has been about Tufts University, uh, which, which straddles uh, Medford and Somerville. Um, but the interesting thing that a lot of, a lot of people have noted uh, online, a lot of people in the community, is that they're didn't seem to be a whole lot of um, uh, discussion with Somerville and Medford about the decision by Tufts, uh, the Tufts president and their trustees to reopen the campus uh, this fall. So um, what do you know about that, Julia? <laughs> sure. Um, you're absolutely right. That is definitely kind of the main concern I've heard is um, when they announced their plan in July, um, a lot of people were like, whoa, like, you know, I live right next to you. Why didn't, why didn't I hear about this before I like read it in the Boston Globe? You know what I mean? Um, so I, I think um, Tufts hosted a community meeting on August 4th. Um, 
where they kind of presented the plan in more detail um, and also uh, answered some questions from residents that had been sent in, uh, some Medford and Summerville residents. Um, but also, I think the point that they made, um, or at least my impression, was that kind of their, their, their argument is that, you know, they did release an initial plan in July to kind of get information out to their community as soon as possible. Um, but that they were always committed to kind of changing and shifting and learning and adjusting. Um, so, and it seems like they are, it seems like they, they have been doing that. Um, I, I will say that, you know, while they did definitely answer a lot of resident questions, um, a lot of questions centered around um, student compliance, especially for off-campus students, because so many students live just like in our neighborhoods. It's like how, okay, tough, like you're, you're mandating masks, you're mandating testing, but how are you going to make sure they do this? You know, if there's someone hosts a party, who do we call? Is it Tufts police? Is it Somerville police? Um, what are the repercussions? Um, you know, when a student tests positive, like what's going to happen to professors? How many times a week are people going to be tested? Um, there are just, there's so many questions, good questions that community members have. Um, and Tufts did answer a good, a good number of them. Um, for example, they're developing an app um, that essentially tracks people's testing and test results um, and says whether or not like they're allowed to be on campus or in class. Um, so they're, they're definitely, de you know, developing some, some pretty serious protocols to maintain the safety of their community. Um, but I did also get the impression that residents weren't entirely uh, kind of uh, sold on, on every part of it. Um, as you know, we're recording this on the 5th and uh, tonight on August 5th, there is a public hearing of the city council. The city council called a special meeting uh, for a couple of reasons, but one of them was to hold a public hearing on the Tufts reopening plan to hear residents' concerns. So I expect we'll hear more of that tonight. Um, so there's, there's still, you know, there's still a lot here, um, but I, I think in general, residents are just concerned that Tufts didn't seem to kind of take into account that like their students go to our gyms, they go to our cafes, they go, you know, to our restaurants, they walk through our streets, um, you know, they work in you know, some rural businesses and that they are just as much a part of this community, which is a good thing, but also that we have to make sure that happens kind of responsibly. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's still some community engagement process to happen. I don't think we're entirely there yet. Um, but Tufts, I think, is going to begin bringing students back and testing students on the 16th. Um, so we're pretty, it, it's happening soon. Right. Um, so it's not, it's not that far out. This is all going to begin. Yeah, what's interesting is um, that, that they're still sticking to uh, what looks like uh, the, the fall school year. Mm -hmm. so, so there's no kind of drawing out of, of, uh, of that. Uh, in any way, just to, to extend testing, to extend quarantine or, or anything like that. And, and the, um, the concern here is also a regional concern, uh, like the Boston metro area, which some of those are part of, um, you know, there's just so many universities, you know, at Harvard, MIT, Berkeley School of Music, Museum School, and, and, you know, each one of them is making a decision and, you know, from the interns, we have interns from uh, Emerson and in, interns from Tufts. Um, Emerson has given students the option to do a hybrid uh, model or a fully remote model. So each one is doing it differently. And I think, I think that's part of the concern is you have students coming in to the region, uh, into our city from all these other parts of the U.S. Uh, where the pandemic ha is worse. Um, and so, you know, what are the protocols for that? Do they have to quarantine for 14 days before they, they start school? Um, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the, there's just a lot of questions. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. That was a big one. Um, and I definitely, I don't know if I can spell out all the details, but Tufts definitely has quite a robust testing plan. Um, I think it's, it's like two to three times a week, um, for students. Um, twice a week for people like custodial staff and dining dining workers and once a week for less student facing staff and faculty um, and also in terms of kind of bringing back students students are required to get to have um, when they come back they're required to quarantine for at least two weeks and have three negative COVID tests before they are allowed to kind of 
move about even kind of with move about in the community with all of the other precautions that they're taking. Um, so there seems to, they seem to be thinking about that for sure. Like that kind of initial kind of coming back to campus thing, like you mentioned with the out of, out of region students. Um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, tough students live in Boston, tough students live all over the place. BU students live in Somerville. You know what I mean? It, it, yeah. It's all over the place. You know what I mean? So it's, it's hard to really know um, what the impact will be. Yeah. Yeah. And usually this time of year, you know, we're, we're seeing the U-Hauls move in yeah. and, and crowd our streets and we're seeing, yep. you know, the student population uh, come back and, and, and descend the way that they do. And so that, you know, the, the fear is, you know, that, that that's going to go on as usual, I think. Um, and, and this is a very unusual time and yeah, more, more to come. Um, so the city council uh, meeting, to tonight on August 5th, um, what's, what's going to be discussed there? Do you know? So I know, um, so there is that public hearing on the Tufts community meeting, t- okay. sorry, the Tufts reopening plan. Um, I expect that will take a while. And I know that they're, they're voting on a couple things. Um, for example, uh, changing some precincts for the, um, primary election in order to like insert, ensure, you know, better COVID precautions and safety. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure what other business they're up to, um, but I think th- this they're typically on recess. <laughs> so this is, this is just a special meeting to, I think, handle a couple urgent things. Very good. <laughs> is there any, is there anything else uh, you want to, you want to sign off with Julia? Yeah, um, sure. I just want to remind everyone that there is a primary election on September 1st, which matters to many some of the residents. There are contested races in the second Middlesex Senate race. Um, so Pat Jalen is being opposed by new candidate Gary Fisher um, in the 27th Middlesex race, um, two new candidates because Representative Denise Provo is stepping down. So we have Erica Eiderhoven and Katya Sharp. And in the 34th Middlesex, um, incumbent Christine Barber is being opposed by Anna Callahan. Um, so we have profiles and questionnaires up on our website. They have, they have wonderful websites and social media. So if you're in one of those districts, um, learn about them. Um, voting matters. Woo. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, um, all Massachusetts residents are being given the choice to vote by mail. Um, I have already received my vote by mail application, um, which I have filled out. And it's just important to know that you've got to get those in by August 26th in order to vote in the September 1st primary by mail. Um, so, and when you get that vote by mail application, you will also have the option to request a vote by mail ballot for the November election. Um, so just a reminder to keep an eye out for that, to remember that there is an election and that voting matters. Um, and I'll be posting more information about voting and making sure everyone's kind of got what they need and in the know. Um, there's also a helpful tool on the Massachusetts uh, legislature website, find my legislator. If you're not sure who your representative is and which district you're in, you can do that. Um, we have info up about that on our website as well. Um, and so, and the, just the last thing is just a fun thing that, um, the Somerville Journal has been featuring an activist of the week. Um, so we've been asking for nominations of youth in our community um, who are just working hard to do cool stuff. Um, and we've had about four or five submissions so far. We've posted two um, of these incredible, um, incredible youth in our schools. Um, one who um, makes and sells candles to benefit immigrants and refugees in our community. Um, another one who has just been like this incredible activist at her school. Um, so we just... You know, it's a tough time for all of us and we just want to recognize some of the goodness um, and the kind of goodness coming up in our community, in our youth. That's great. Um, so if you have anything, please email me um, at jtaliesin, T-A-L-I-E-S-I-N at wickedlocal.com or you can message us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of the places. Um, but yeah, we'd love all it to places. get more submissions. <laughs> Uh, that, yeah, that's great. Um, and I will, I'll just add, uh, yeah, get, get that, um, uh, mail in, get the request to, to get a mail in ballot in as soon as possible, um, to make sure that, that you can do that, uh, for the primary and the general election. Um, and that, uh, Somerville Media Center, uh, we've been working hard. Uh, we produce, we co-produced some candidate profiles, uh, about a month ago. Those have been running nonstop, uh, on our channel. Uh, at various times, so check those out. Um, you can also see them at our video on demand at somervillemedia.org or on our Roku channel on demand. Um, so, so be sure to watch that. And we also have 
uh, Joe Lynch uh, spoke with um, Joe Kennedy this morning, um, and he will be speaking with Ed Markey. Um, so we will have some uh, coverage of the Senate race. Oh, that's exciting. Um, yeah, that is exciting. Um, so look out for that. Um, I want to thank Julia Taliesin from the Summer Jul- Somerville Journal once again. Uh, and the Somerville Journal website is somerville.wigalocal.com. So be sure to uh, visit that website to read a little more in depth about everything we touched on. Uh, you can go to somervillemedia.org to check out everything that we're doing at Somerville Media Center. Um, thank you, Julia. Thank you. And uh, for Somerville Media Center, uh, I'm Dave Ortega signing off. Join us uh, for another roundup uh, in a couple of weeks.